it all be familiar. I think it was about a year ago I preached six or seven messages out of this one chapter here on the prodigal, but I got a different thought that I want to share with you tonight. I preached out this passage so many times, I covered every one in it. I preached on the prodigal. I preached on the prodigal's father. I preached on the prodigal's brother. I preached on the, uh, the pig pen. I think I preached on everything. I even preached on the prodigal's mother from this passage. You say, wait a minute. The prodigal's mother's not mentioned here. Yeah, that's why it was titled, Where's Mama? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Boy, that's a thought. Just think about where's mama? Where's mama in a lot of this stuff? I tell you, it changed some things. It really would. But anyway, let's go ahead and look at this passage again. In Luke 15, uh, let's see. I know that most of you are familiar with this passage, so let's just go ahead and start at verse 11. He said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together, he took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the, wine did eat, that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto, say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, and we know the rest of the story. While he was yet a great ways off, the father saw him. He came, ran, hugged him, kissed him. He put on shoes on his feet, a robe on his hand, a ring on his finger. The, the father took him in, forgave him, threw, threw, killed the fatty calf, threw a party, made the older brother, the older brother mad. And we know we know the story. But what I want to focus on is found in, right here in this verse, in verse 17. And when he came to himself. He came to himself. I want to talk to you a little bit about pig pen psychology. Pig pen psychology. That boy learned some things. That prodigal learned some things in the pig pen that his father could not convey to him. That his mother could not get through his thick skull. That he could not learn by watching his elder brother. There was something in that pig pen that no one else was going to be able to get through to him. He had to go through that pig pen experience. There was no ifs, ands, and buts about it. He was headstrong. He had made up his mind. There was no changing, no going back. He was going into that far country regardless who said what, who right. did what. Yep. He was gone. Right. He was gone. Now the prodigal son, he wandered into that far country into that strange land. He was in a strange place doing strange things. And, and he found himself uh, wandering around in his, and, and, and he found himself in a predicament he never thought that he would be in. He never dreamed that he would be where he was at. In his mind, he had visions of grandeur and he seen great things for his future. But he found himself in a stinking, filthy pig pen, in the muck and in the mire, desiring to eat with the animals he had been hired to feed. He found himself, he came to himself, and he woke up. You know, it's a shame that sometimes the only way we learn things is through the pig pen experience. It's a shame that we have to learn it the hard way. How many of you have the education from the school of hard knocks? Amen. It took some hard knocks to get some things in your head. I was 22 before I got saved. I've seen a pig pen or two in my time. Amen. And it's a shame that we are that way. And you know what really scares me? When our kids 
our kids that are raised in church, our kids that we pray over and we invest love and time and energy in, when they won't listen and they turn to that far country, that's what scares me. Amen. Because I know what's out there. They're looking at the lights of Sodom, but they don't see the pig pen. They see all the shiny, flashy lights. They see the promise of fun, fame, fortune. They don't see the bills, the blisters, the bawling. They don't see that. They always show you the neon lights and the fun life. They don't show you Amen. that pig pen. And it scares me to know that, that, that ours can do that. Our kids can do that. But you know, it scares me just as much to know that we've got grown-ups that do it. Amen. We've got grown-ups that have lived and experienced some life and had some wisdom and should have some life experience and know better. Still be tempted by those same lights. By those same promises of fun and financial success or whatever and, and be led astray. I'm thankful that in that muck and mire, the prodigal came to himself. The father's prayer was answered, but not before the boy had to be drugged through the pig pen. We find ourselves oftentimes praying, Lord, be gentle with them. But our prayer ought to be, Lord, whatever it takes, bring them back. Some people, the only way they're going to learn is to go through their pig pen experience. That's all the way they're going to learn. Some are sensitive, have a sensitive heart, they have a sensitive conscience, and, and they're only there for an hour or two till they realize, what am I doing? They look at the field and they smell the smell and they see the, the wickedness that's around them and they recall how good it was at home and they recall how, what their father wants for them and they say, what am I doing? And they get out. But others, it may not be hours. It may be weeks. It may be months. And God help them, some spend years down there. But the saddest thing of all is knowing that some probably will die in their people. But here in this story, the prodigal here, the boy that went into that far country, he came to himself. We're not told how long he was down there. We, he was down there long enough to blow all of his inheritance, to lose all of his friends, to find himself homeless and helpless, humbled even to, to take a job feeding swine as a Jewish boy. He found himself doing things he never thought he'd do. When he left out, he had big ambitions. He had big dreams. Hopes and desires flooded his heart. Now he's in a place of disgust and discouragement and, 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 and just stench all around him. He stinks. His life stinks. His outlook stinks. But there in that pig pen, he remembered the Father's house. He probably remembered singing in a choir or sitting in a Sunday school class or sitting in a pew or sitting under Brother Ryan in junior church. Probably remembered how good it was sitting there hungry. Probably remembered getting a biscuit on Jimmy's bus route. He's sitting there hungry wondering what in the world have I done? And he came to himself. The father's been praying, I'm sure. Mama's been praying, I'm sure. The older brother, he still made him don't care. But the father's been praying, Lord, get a hold of his heart. Mama, no doubt, has been praying, Lord, get my boy home, bring my boy home. Lord, take care of my boy. But the prayer's being answered in a pig pen. He comes to himself. Let me give you just a couple things and we'll go. I don't plan on being long. And y'all said, oh no, we're here all night now. <laughs> First of all, the pig pen called this prodigal. The pig pen calls them. The, the pig pen has been calling them ever since this parable was told. That's over 2,000 years. The pig pen still calling our boys and our girls. Still calling moms and dads even. They're still being lured into the pig pens of this world. They're still being called. 
They call, they call and they give you the promise of fun and friends and making you famous. They're lured in by the promise of late night fun, of laughter and of ladies. And, and he probably dreamed of all those things only to find famine, fatigue, and funeral if he didn't leave. He would have died in that place. <coughs> Not only did the pig pen call the prodigal, but the pig pen captured him. That was not his intent. That was the pig pen's intent all along. That's the world's intention all along. The devil wants to take you in and throw you into that pig pen and let you rot and die in that fucking mire. And he's happy as can be right there. That's his goal. The father wanted him to stay on the farm. The father wanted him to stay in the farm farmer's house and with him, with the family. But the prodigal thought he'd have more fun out in that far country. Let me ask you, maybe you're that prodigal and you're in a pig pen now. Say, preacher, I'm in church. Yeah, you might be sitting in here. You're, you're at the beginning stages. You've already, you're already looking into that that, you're already looking into that far country and you're being lured by those promises. You can't smell the pig pen because you're not quite that close yet. The stench isn't on you yet because you haven't had to spend much time there yet, but you're going that way in your mind and heart. Just remember the prodigal. Just remember the prodigal and learn from the prodigal that you don't have to go down there and you don't have to suffer like he did. He was captured down there. Many never make it out, but he made it out. He came to himself and said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough in despair, and I perish with hunger? Yes. Then I want you to notice the pig pen counseled this prodigal. The pig pen actually did the counseling. Could you imagine sitting there feeding those swine? Here's this Jewish boy, and these animals are filthy, nasty, biblically, spiritually unclean animals, and his job is to care for the swine, to feed them. That was a nasty animal to them. That, they were abominations to the Jews, and his job is to raise them and care for them and feed them. What a horrible thing. How many though, how many people, he never intended to do that. And I got to thinking, I wonder how many people wind up in a place they never intended to be. I wonder how many girls walk the street selling their body for the next hit. That was their goal, their dream. When some school teacher asked them in elementary school, what's your dream? I want to grow up and be a hooker. None of them had that dream. How many put down, I want to be a junkie, or I want to be a, a, a dope head, or an alcoholic. I, 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 want, to, I want to be an abusive husband. I want to be a cheating, a cheating spouse. That's what I want to be when I grow up. None of them have that. None of us have that. But sometimes when we look into that far country, and we listen to the lies of the devil and the lies of Egypt and Sodom and Babylon. We listen to the lies of the world trying to suck us out of the Father's house. We'll find ourselves in the pig pen. We'll find ourselves in places we never dreamed we would be. I imagine that boy sat there when he came to himself and he looked at the filthy shape he was in. He came, he, he came out of there like royalty. He had money. He had friends. He had good clothing. He had the best camel you could buy down at the camel lot. I mean, he was good shape. But now, he probably don't even have shoes on. He sold everything that he could sell just so he could have something to eat. His clothes stinks like pig manure and pig slop from walking in there and feeding them and getting that slop splattered all over him. You can, if you've ever been into a where they raised pigs, I mean commercially raised pigs, that is one of the most stinkingest places you've ever been. And the smell of that sewage 
You don't have to touch it. You can just walk through where they're at and it gets on you. It gets in your hair. It gets in your clothing. It gets on your skin. Even if you change clothes, you still smell like sewage. It's terrible. And here's this Jewish boy thinking about what he said to his father the last time he left. How he got mad when he stormed out of the church. How he got aggravated because he didn't get his way. Or she got aggravated because it wasn't when she wanted it or the way she wanted it. And think about how silly that argument was. How foolish it was. That's the pig pen. The pig pen was counseling that boy. He sat there and he thought, Lord, what was I thinking? Lord, why did I not listen to the Father? Why did I not listen to my Father? Why did I not listen to them when they tried to reason with me? The pig pen is a good teacher if they'll listen. We don't want the pig pen for our children. We want the pig pen for our loved ones, our friends, our neighbors. I don't want the pig pen for you. But sometimes it takes the pig pen to teach us what we need to know. Yeah. This pig pen did some counseling. It showed uh, the reality of life. It showed it could be hard and harsh. And that pig pen humbled this prodigal. Not only did it call him and capture him, but it counseled him. And it changed him. Number four, it changed him. This boy that went out cocky, Know it all. Has all the answers. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'll do what I want to on my terms in my time. And I'm going to be my own man, my own boss. That same child comes back with a different attitude. Why? Because he had been humbled by the pig pig. You say, preacher, that's horrible, that's terrible. Yes, it is, and I don't wish the pig pit on any of our children or our grandchildren or any of y'all. But you know there's probably going to be some in here. And you, you think about some of these that's getting on the bus. You think about some of these kids. I was looking around. I enjoyed, man, just seeing that choir full this morning, that youth choir full. Love seeing them kids just running around like... Like piss ants going in and out of the pews. It was just wild there for a little bit and enjoyed it. I enjoyed every minute of it. You say, preacher, it gets a little wild in here, don't it, sometimes when they first come in? Amen. Yeah. That's an answered prayer. If Amen. you remember, don't fuss about it. We've been praying for it. Amen. Amen. That's what we've been wanting. Amen. I, I still hadn't seen one climbing the walls. So I was praying for someone climbing the walls. I hadn't seen that yet, so we ain't got enough yet. So when we got enough, when they're climbing the walls, it's time to slow down. Build or slow down one, amen. <laughs> but anyway, I, I imagine some of them, and it breaks my heart to think that some of them That's right. is going to wind up in the pig pen because they won't listen. That's right, bro. Some of them is going to wind up in the pig pen because they're not going to believe us. They look out there and they see how you are just dry, lifeless. You look bored out of your gourd. You look depressed and discouraged. You don't look like you've just been saved. You don't look like you've been delivered from hell. You don't look like you should have joy and peace that goes this beyond understanding. It don't show on your face that you have that joy in your heart on Sunday morning. I can see it in them. But I ought to see it in y'all. Y'all understand what the Lord's done for you. They're still trying to get answers. The only difference is they got energy and we don't. That's right. Amen. We got old and tired. Amen. We've got to learn to at least put some effort in our praise. You say, wait a minute, what are you talking about, preacher? Put effort in your praise. If not for the Lord, do it for them. Amen. 
Do it for them while they're singing, yeah. that they might see the Lord use them. Do it for them, that they might be able to see that the Lord is using their singing to be a blessing to y'all. Don't just sit there and stare at them on Sunday morning. Yeah. Don't just sit there and stare. Uh, it's, you, now, I'm going to be honest with you. Now, Ryan, back me up. Back me up right here. Help me, help me on this. Is it hard to preach when nobody responds? You, you're preaching up a storm. You're giving it all you've got. And you're thinking, man, that's good. And you you turn around and look and you think it ought to be hooting and hollering. They're sitting there chewing their chewing gum, playing with a rapper. Amen. Looking at the watch. I mean, I was just talking about Jesus saving us from hell and the price that He paid and how good it is to be saved and have assurance that never have to burn. Never have to worry about it again. Boy, that's good stuff. We get a hold of it. See, the problem is you forgot just how good He's been. You've let the devil and the world suck the joy of your salvation. Why? Has it because you've been looking too much at the lights and the glitter? I'm telling you, right behind the lights and the glitter, just around the corner down the street is the pig pen. Right. I promise you, it's not far. I guarantee you, it was in easy walking distance of town. He didn't have to go far. He didn't have to go far. He may have went in for the lights and the laughter and all the joy and the excitement and the ladies that was there, but he wound up laying with the hogs. Not a good place to be. It changed him though. He come back humble. Honest. Did you notice that? I never caught that till this week when I was reading that. A lot of them go out and they lie and they tell stories and they make up excuses as to why they justify their leaving the Father's house. I imagine they was fussing. I imagine they was fighting. I imagine he told stories why he left the church, why he left why he left his wife, why she left her husband. They told stories to justify them doing what they'd done. But buddy, after the hog pen, they come back humbled and honest. I've sinned against you, Father. I've sinned against you, Father. And I've sinned against my brothers. And I've sinned against this. He was, he was getting things right. The hog pen opened his eyes. He realized what he had done and how good he had it at one time. And he knew the only way back was to humble it, humble himself and be honest before God the Father. Then came the happiness. Then came the forgiveness and the ring and the robe and the fatted calf and shoes on his feet. Then came the acceptance. It was later. It didn't come without problems. Remember, the elder brother was still upset. But he got forgiveness. When he humbled himself, was honest with the Father, and he can't have happiness. Maybe you're in the hole pen now, and you don't think you can have happiness. I want you to know, happiness was there. But that's the key. That's the steps back. That's how you get from the hog pen back to the Father's house. Humble yourself. Be honest with the, yourself and the Father. Then will come to happiness. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes.